as we're heading into this year's NBA playoffs, if you recall, there almost weren't a playoffs at all just a season ago. I'm Robin Lundberg here now with national NBA writer for the Washington Post and author of the new book, Bubble Ball, Inside the NBA's Fight to Save a Season, Ben Golliver. And Ben, you know, I, I want to talk about the basketball aspect of your book because, I, you know, I read a, an excerpt from it that, that I found very interesting in regards to that. But first, the, the big picture aspect. I mean, the subtitle is about the fight to save a season. How much did you learn about how close, you know, the, the bubble was to not happening and, and how it all came together? Well, look, there was a lot of motivation to make this thing a reality. But of course, there was a lot of fear and uncertainty about the pandemic last year. And so we sat all waiting, you know, March, April and into May of 2020, seeing could they put a plan together? Ultimately, the plan they came up with needed multiple check uh, checkpoints, I guess, of approval from the players. Right. I mean, they had to agree to the health and safety rules. They had to understand how the finances were going to work. They had to agree to where they were going to live, the accommodations and all those things were tricky. I mean, for a guy like me who's living in a one-bedroom apartment and driving a Ford, it's no big deal to go down to a Disney World hotel for a couple months. For guys who've got, you know, mansions and personal chefs and you're taking helicopters to games in some cases, uh, that's a big uh, lifestyle adjustment. So it was very tricky at the start. And then again, of course, there was a, a crisis moment during the bubble following the uh, the Bucks decision to shut down and, and to not play. Um, you know, basically to, to not take the court against the Orlando Magic during the playoffs, there was three days without games. And again, the players had some pretty heated conversations there on the Wednesday night in the aftermath of that decision, trying to figure out, did they want to continue to play? Did they want to put this thing together? And so I think that those um, decisions, both before the bubble and sort of at the halfway mark of the experience, just add to the drama and add to the story of what was a really incredible experiment uh, from the NBA and the Players Union. We, we all know the, the real life events that, that were causing stress, as you mentioned, Ben. But also, you know, it wasn't just a lifestyle thing, right? I mean, there, there was a mental toll to playing in that bubble and being in that bubble all the time. Well, absolutely. Look, the pandemic was, has been hard on everybody, right? We're all feeling isolated away from our loved ones. And thankfully, with the vaccinations here, some of that stuff is starting to change over the last couple of months. But at that point, um, the bubble was like the most isolating place you could be. You know, you, you couldn't even walk down the street two miles. You couldn't drive a car. Um, you could ride a bicycle in certain situations, but you couldn't go very far. We were surrounded by four different levels of security, NBA security, uh, Disney security, local police. There was video surveillance on this campus. There was all sorts of rules and regulations, many different devices I had to wear that tracked my movements. And I had to have a credential on me at all times. I mean, one time at night, an SUV rolled up on me and demanded to see my credential. I was glad I had it. I don't know what would have happened had I not. And so for the players, not only were they dealing with the stress of the playoffs, and we know that's going to be magnified every single year, you know, win or go home type of an atmosphere, but they also had to deal with being separated from their families in many cases, their loved ones, um, and just the outside world. And, and that isolation was tough. I mean, you heard it from LeBron James, Paul George, a lot of different players and I co-sign everything they said. You know, when I was down there in the bubble, I put on weight. I slept terribly. My anxiety was up. I did feel completely isolated from everyone uh, who I cared about. And uh, certainly, I think by the end of the experience, a lot of people were counting down the days and ready to go home. Now, when it comes to the, the basketball inside the bubble, you are, you know, being watched very closely, obviously, by everybody there. And, and one of the, the teams you focused on in a portion of the book was the Philadelphia 76ers and, and how really, I think, the, the change between what they were doing to what they're now doing with Daryl Morey and Doc Rivers came to be as a result of their, their playoff series there. Well, look, in those empty gyms, there's nowhere to hide, Robin, right? I mean, it's sort of like an emperor with no clothes type situation. If you don't have your chemistry right, if you don't have your lineup combinations uh, properly set up, you're going to get exposed and everyone's going to be able to see it. And I actually thought Philadelphia had one of the most painful exits from the bubble of anybody, right? I mean, completely sweeped and embarrassed, really humiliated by the Boston Celtics. They didn't have Ben Simmons because of injury, but Joel Embiid had dominant numbers, but not really a dominant impact. They were outplayed strategically by the Celtics and Brad Stevens. Uh, you saw a number of technical fouls late in that series, just frustration from Brett Brown. And, and within one week of the start of the playoffs last year, Brett Brown was already fired. The Sixers were already on their way home. And then within a few months, as you mentioned, they uh, they changed coaches, they changed front office leads, and they've really had an, a remarkable turnaround this season. 
I think it's a real credit to Joel Embiid, a guy who was obviously frustrated and just kind of beside himself at times during those playoffs, um, just not really having any answers against Boston. It's a real credit to him that he was able to mentally refocus, pull himself together, and have an MVP caliber season this year. Because uh, I think that uh, it would have been easy for some teams to splinter even more than they did. And I think that their response to that bubble experience has been really impressive from Philadelphia. And, and it was a one of one kind of situation, right? I mean, um, not only, you know, will we always remember that LeBron and the Lakers, of course, won the, the, the championship there, though, but there, there was no travel, um, no fans, you know, the, the, the sort of performances in, in a way. I remember Dame Lillard had said, um, he, People tried to take it the wrong way, but I think he, he meant it was easier on the body. So you're getting your best performances and, and you might have seen some of that. Well, I think for Philadelphia in particular, what was tough was they were such a good home court team in Philly all of last year. They barely lost at home. And so when they go down 2-0 in that series against Boston, they're thinking, well, you know, in a normal year, we're flying back to our crib and we're going to win two and it's going to be tied up 2-2. And of course, down in the bubble, everything's neutral site. There are no crowds. There's fewer than you know a couple hundred people in these gyms. You don't have anybody to give you that boost, whether it's a positive boost cheering or a negative boost, you know, booing you a little bit like sometimes those Sixers fans like to do, right? And so for them, you're just sort of out there on an island by yourself and they didn't respond to that well. But it was an adjustment period for all those different teams. I mean, you'll remember back uh, you know, last March when LeBron said, if there's no fans in the stands, I don't want to play. I mean, he's a guy who's a natural showman. He's always used to having uh, you know, a crowd and feeding off of it. And the Lakers had to make that same adjustment when they got to the bubble. They became one of the most vocal teams in the gym, some trash talking, calling out a lot of defensive coverages, and then, of course, cheering each other on as they were making that push to the title. So not everybody adjusted the same way, right? I mean, there were some teams like the Sixers, the Rockets, the Clippers, and the Bucks that went home earlier than they expected. And there were some other teams uh, like the Lakers, the Heat, the Celtics, the Nuggets, who are able to go deeper and, and kind of find a better uh, balance and formula in those strange environments. And you can find out how each team got to where they did and how all of it came to be in Ben Golliver's new book, Bubble Ball. Ben, appreciate your time as always. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. Thanks a lot.